record. Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cavanis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. The Jason Cavanis Experience is brought to you by Cavanis HR. Cavanis HR delivers HR to companies with 49 or less people across the United States. Cavanis HR, focus on your business. We've got your HR. Our guest today is Preem Kumar. Preem, are you ready to be great today? Absolutely, Jason. Preem is currently the CEO and co-founder of Humanly, an AI platform that screens and schedules job candidates for companies with high applicant volume. Prior to that, Preem led the product management and design team at Tiny Pulse, an employee engagement company that empowers organizations to build world-class cultures with real-time people data. Prior to Tiny Pulse, he spent 10 years at Microsoft working in a variety of product capacities, including within Microsoft's HR tech department. In addition to his day job, he loves sharing his, his ideas through writing as a member of the Forbes Business Council, representing the U.S. as a Peter Drucker essay challenge winner in 2013, as well as, 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 well as receiving two Best of Think Week awards for white papers aimed at breaking down cultural barriers at Microsoft. Outside of work, he spends his time with his two wife, two kids and wife, and enjoy his travel in Seattle sports. Preem, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So Preem, on your um, LinkedIn profile, where it's you know, the about the about part, it says about you helping organizations bring equity and efficiency to the hiring process. process. What, what does that mean exactly? Like, can, you, can you break that down some? Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're specifically humanly focused on um, the screening and scheduling of job candidates. Um, so there's a lot of time currently being spent by recruiting coordinators and reading through hundreds of resumes, um, you know, getting back to candidates with, with answers to their questions. So we specifically have automated some pieces of that process. Um, and from an equity standpoint, um, right now there's there's a lot of bias involved. So there's a great zip recruiter study that said 72%, some, something like 72% of jobs used gendered words in them or bias triggered words, um, job descriptions. And, and just removing the wording, just how you phrase it can increase candidate volume. So we see a lot of things happening both from an inefficiency standpoint and an inequity standpoint in the screen screening process specifically, and particularly with roles that have really high volume. So think entry-level sales, entry-level support, operations, when you're getting hundreds of resumes. So Preem, what's the point of even, even doing this when hiring managers go to your LinkedIn profile and see who you are, right? Like, what, what's the point of even doing this? When eventually you're going to see if you're male, female, black, white, they're going to eventually know who you are anyway, right? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, most of the time, only about 20% of candidates even have a human look at their resume or go to their LinkedIn. Most candidates are being ignored or stripped out um, based on the applicant tracking system logic right now. So I think one problem we're solving is trying to allow you to engage with everyone at scale, not just the 20% you have time for. And of the 20% that humans are reviewing, the average recruiter spends about seven seconds per person. So we feel that by giving recruiters the same tools that maybe salespeople have for engaging with prospects or marketers have for engaging with visitors to the site, um, we'll be able to make people uh, more efficient at what they do. And this kind of subject, but I think another problem too is like job descriptions. I think most companies, they copy and paste the same old job description over and over again, or what they do, you know, Tom is a great salesperson. Let's base this on what Tom does. Well, you're not hiring Tom Jr., right? You got to hire for the specific positions. How, how do we even get to fixing that? Yeah, absolutely. And there's some great tools like Textio here out of Seattle that can help you write uh, more effective job descriptions. So, so absolutely. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, if, if hiring teams had unlimited time, money, and resources, I, th I think they'd start every candidate interaction with a conversation, not by going through pieces of paper. So, Preem, you know, it, this is my opinion. For the longest time, you know, there's a lot of people out there trying to solve recruiting, hiring, either with an HR background or not HR background. There's so many, you know, quote-unquote HR tech companies trying to solve it. I mean, this, I mean, literally hundreds of them out there, right? And, and it doesn't like many of them are making any progress, right, or actually fixing anything. Why are so many people trying and why are so many people failing to fix this problem? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, um, so I remember when I graduated uh, from the University of Washington in 2006, uh, the, I had a bad candidate experience. Some, some companies were great, some weren't, obviously not going to name any names, but um, 
nothing has really changed in, in terms of those negative candidate experiences for these high volume jobs. What, what has changed is now candidates that have negative experiences at a very high rate are sharing that on Glassdoor, they're going out there. So I think, I, I think it's now with the hit to employer brand with bottom line costs being affected by negative candidate experiences, you're seeing companies invest more. Um, so I think there's the problem has always been there, but now where technology is and where, where some of the, the tech that was used in marketing and sales is, you can now pretty quickly get to market with a solution. Um, but I think what's really going to be valuable over time is not, not just solving it technology, but um, having a, you know, a good system in place that fits into your human workflow as well as the automated workflow. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot of advances in data. Um, there's a lot of advances in technology that causes this to be an easier problem to solve now than it once was. And that takes time, but I know there's a lot of jobs. Like I remember I was an HR director at a local college and we would have like 20 positions open any time and average like 200 resumes per, per <laughs> job, right? And I think some people say, well, that's too many to reply to. Well, I think that's your responsibility, right? To protect your employer brand. If nothing else, some kind of generic email, something, you know, it's not do a black hole, right? I think there's so many ways to work around that because it's yeah. destroying people's employer brands. Absolutely. And, and honestly, you paid in time and money to attract those people to, to get to the, your web page, your apply in the first place. So there's a lot you can do with that audience. So if 200 people apply, one person gets the job, what are you doing to engage that the rest of the 199 so that they can be future candidates, they can be advocates, like you're saying, they might even be customers in B2C context. So if I were to tell a marketer that we're driving 300 eyeballs to a website, but we only have time to engage with like five of them, that, that would obviously be a fail. So I think there's a lot that can be done. It's, and, and it's not necessarily the fault of hiring teams or recruiters. They're um, really great ones. Um, I, I think it's, you know, they didn't always have the tools to be able to do that at scale. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, how did you become, how did writing become a passion of yours? Um, it's kind of interesting. I, I've always enjoyed getting my thoughts down so I can share them so I can look at them later. Um, you know, I think in college, I, I took a, a writing class, creative writing class and read a book. Um, I think it was called Writing Down the Bones. Um, it was about creative writing that really uh, inspired me. And I, I never really did a whole lot of it until I had a job that I wasn't that <laughs> passionate about or engaged with. And um, I needed another outlet to be able to, to really um, feel fulfilled. Um, and, and I kind of turned to writing for that. So how, how do you become a good writer? Is this a matter of repetition over and over again? Or is that you have to have some kind of creative process or how did you become such a good writer? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I particularly am an amazing writer, but a lot, I think what really it just comes down to doing it. So I think getting out there, repetition, practice, um, you know, not looking at it as like a, a linear process, but whenever you have a th or an idea or an inspiration, just jotting it down. So I think a repetition is a, is a great way of doing it and then sharing it. It can be very um, intimidating to put yourself out there and share it, but I think you learn a lot when you see how people are resonating with, with your message. Um, yep. So when you do your writing, like suppose you had to write out a news article for a magazine, do you do it all at one sitting or you like break it down to steps? Yeah, so if it, in, that, in that sort of context, um, I, I would try and have some structure to it. So, um, you know, you, but that being said, you don't want the structure to inhibit you from having creativity and creative ideas. So anytime I write anything, you know, I'll revisit it, um, you know, after I've had a cup of coffee or revisit it a day later um, and kind of look at it from a little bit of a different lens. But I think from a structure standpoint, first off, just making consistent time so that you're progressing. Um, so maybe setting aside 30 minutes a day or, or an hour a day or wh whatever it is, um, you know, maybe starting with in that kind of more formal context, starting with a structure and an outline is, is pretty useful. But then don't be too married to a particular idea where you can't, you know, p push in new new um, ideas later or change the structure. So I, I do think it's writing generally is nonlinear, but giving it a kind of linear format to start it helps you get ideas out. So back to recruiting, and this is my opinion. I, I think if you, someone can solve dis, disconnect, they go away, go a long way to solving recruiting problems. So usually, you know, someone needs to find a job, they've been laid off, fired, or new college graduate, and they need, they need a job within a month, right? They need a job like right away. And most companies, you know, are, you know, go by the philosophy, you know, hire slow, right? So they're taking the time, three, four months, you know. Of course, some place like Amazon take forever, you know. So this big disconnect, the candidate needs a job right now, and a company that's like, well, no, we're going to take our time, right? 
how do you, is there a way to fix that disconnect? Yeah, so it's definitely, and it, it of course depends on, you know, the type of role in the organization. But um, I, I mean, I think the first thing is a pretty um, clear one around communication. So I think what you mentioned with the black hole is a big problem. If you, if you know, for example, that, you know, this company's recruiting process is going to take one month, um, here are the steps in it, here's when to expect what communication, then, then you can plan around that. Um, you know, it might not be ideal, um, but you at least know which companies, what the processes are for each company. So I think clear having employees employers clearly state how the process works. Um, Cause right now it really is a black hole. You submit your resume and then maybe you hear back, maybe you don't. Um, so I think expectation setting around process is really important. Um, and I think it's also a, a continued relationships that, that's built. So maybe this candidate didn't get a job at Amazon this time, but they um, want to stay in touch for later jobs. So I think what happens after a role is filled is also important um, because it could speed up the cycle time next time around if, if they feel you're a qualified candidate and you pass the basic uh basic things they're looking for so so Prem, one time i'm hearing you say but you did actually say is networking the importance of networking can you talk about that how important that is to people yeah no i, I think networking is certainly especially when you do it in an authentic way i think the more people that you can have that are fans of what you're doing that know what you're working on um the the better off you'll be and and people People generally want to help, I find, and I think if you uh, contribute to the community as well, um, to the network, um, you get in what you put out when it comes to, you get out what you put in when it comes to networking in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, I mean, you talk to a lot of people that have had 30-year careers, and they never had to apply to a job after the first five years because they had been told about one through someone in their network. Um, so yeah, I, I would, you know, definitely go out of your way to keep your network apprised on what you're doing, and then people often will help. I think one way not to do is this. I have a good friend who owns a company in Texas, and she was telling me that out of the blue, this person you know, reached out to her after, I think, four years, but not hearing nothing from this person, and basically said, hey, I just lost my job. Are you hiring, right? So I definitely think that's not the way to do it, you know? Yeah, one good example of that is so um, one thing we sent, set out um, for our startup is we'll send a monthly update that keeps our investors appraised, that keeps our network updated on what we're doing. Um, and I've been told that, that that's a really great way because then when I do need help, uh, that we're engaged, they know what's happening versus other, um, there's been examples where other companies might, you know, not say anything and then they come in like nine months later saying, hey, we're, we need help. We're, uh, we need favors. Uh, so I think kind of keeping people up to date, but also helping them. Like you said, I think if if you don't talk to someone for 10 years and all of a sudden you're asking for a favor, it, that's what it is. It's a, it's a favor. But I think if you're uh, if you're actually continuing to nurture that relationship, it's not anymore asking for favors. It's just being mutually helpful to others. Yeah, I definitely think, like you said, you know, people got to research their companies, right? I have a couple of friends that work at Amazon's HR department, and they say, even though on the website it says, do not come in coat and tie, whatever, they say every day people come to Amazon interviews in coat and ties, right? Yeah, and there, there's a lot of examples I've seen of that. Um, that that's, a, that's a good one right there. A lot of times, um, you know, there, we have one customer of ours where um, about 20% of candidates that make it to the phone screen um, missed a basic thing that's written in the job description, such as needing a driver's license because the job requires you driving or um, willing to travel. So a lot of times what's happening with this dynamic is candidates are sending their resume everywhere and um, it's becoming a lot easier to do that. It's not necessarily just the candidate's fault, but because of the inequity and the lack of communication, they're just, you know, not even reading through and preparing and, and having to just blast the resume out because they don't know if they're going to hear back or not. So yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to research the company, research who you're meeting with, ask for the names of the interviewers so you can look them up on LinkedIn, um, you know, use, you know, similar tactics to how a, a salesperson might um, engage with a prospect. Yes. So for your own, own startup, Humanly, you recently got accepted a YC Combinator, correct? Yeah, yeah. We just finished. Um, so we were part of the winter 20 class of, of Y Combinator. Um, so it fi finished a couple months ago. Um, awesome experience. So any, any pointers or advice you can give to any startup founders looking to uh, apply to YC Combinator? Yeah, I mean, it kind of depends on what first just knowing what your goals are. So are are you looking to get fundraising? Are you looking to grow? So I think just be, having a clear um, set of goals and, and 
the different accelerators can potentially help you with different things. Um, in terms of the process, um, you know, I, I think just be really authentic um, and honest and um, they're not there to see companies necessarily that already are at, you know, crazy revenue numbers. Um, they're really looking to help you. So I think one hang up that people have in, in the um, application and then in the interview is they try too hard to impress the group, but really engaging in an authentic conversation around, you know, the problem you're solving, I think is, um, is, is one tip I'd give. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily for everyone, but it can be very, very useful in, in propelling your business forward. We, we it really it helped us a lot. Yeah. Correct me if wrong, but the acceptance rate is like less than 1%, correct? Yeah, there's some, it, it's pretty low. Um, and I think the percents vary. That, that being said, there's a lot of good content online from, from Mike, Siebel um, at, uh, at Y Combinator. And, and, you know, if even though the overall acceptance rate seems daunting, I think if you follow the, the process and look at what they're looking for and you really feel that you meet those criteria, you'd have a pretty good chance of succeeding. So he's, he's done, there's a lot of stuff online around, you know, and it kind of goes back to what you said earlier about applying for a job and not necessarily researching the company. I think there's enough material out there on the Y Combinator application process and, and other accelerators where you can really increase your chances if you understand how the process works and what, what they expect of you. I know some accelerators like Techstars, they, they, I think they accept like 10 per city. There's one called Generator 8 out of Milwaukee, offers like five per year. Why is it coming? Actually, it offers a lot of like um, companies a chance to go in, right? Yes, yeah, definitely. So, and I think, you know, there's Techstars is great. I, I mentor for them. Um, 500 Startups is another great one. Um, so yeah, different, um, you know, there was, there's obviously a lot of differences, not just in the bat sizes, but in, um, you know, the regions and stuff. So I know 500 startups is uh, pretty international, which, which is one thing. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely differences in the cohorts for each of them. So I, I think there's one school of thought that's like, you know, if you get accelerated, you know, definitely take it. It's a lot of value added, you know, and I think other campus like don't do it because they take too much equity from you. What do you think about the school, two schools of thought? Yeah, it really depends on what you're trying to get out of it. So for us, it was 100% worth it. I think um, for other companies, potentially it isn't. So um, the way we looked at it, so they, um, the great thing about accelerators, most of the big ones is they'll all list exactly what the deal is. So with Y Combinator, it's 150K for 7%. And you don't look at that and say, is, is um, 150K worth um, seven percent of my business. Uh, you don't. It's not that simple. You basically look at how much is the value you're getting from the network, from um, from the mentoring, from your peers, and is that plus the money worth the seven percent? So I think it's important to look at. You know, if if you are a business that is maybe doesn't have goals to raise around anytime soon, or um, doesn't have you know aggressive growth goals, which is fine. Um, then maybe acceleration isn't necessarily what you're looking for. So it really depends on the business, but um, the best way I found to, to find out which accelerator is right for you or if any accelerator is right for you, of course, go online. There's lots of stuff, but talking to, talking to um, companies um, and CEOs and founders that have gone through it. And I, I myself am happy to always am talking to one actually later today um, that's considering um, different accelerators. So I think um, talking to folks that have gone through it will help you understand if it's right for your business. I think what people might miss is like, if you go to YC Comedy Tech Stars, you're like a YC Comedy company for life, right? You can always go back over and over again and use the resources, correct? Yes, yes. And that, that's huge. So you can, you know, take advantage of office hours with partners. Um, you're part of the network. You're part of, you know, the Slack channels and, and all sorts of uh, ways of networking. So, I mean, I um, probably read, even though we already graduated, I probably read like 50 uh, messages a day uh, from other founders in Y Combinator that are slacking each other or um, WhatsApping or, or things of that nature. So yeah, that, that that's another benefit where you're not just looking at exchanging 7% or whatever the percent is for these three months. You're looking at it as a long-term growth partner for your business. So Preem, how did you get involved in HR tech? Um, I've always, always kind of been passionate about people and technology. And um, I, uh, when I was at, at Microsoft, um, uh, it's actually kind of ties back to um, my writing. So I, I was starting to write. And what I found that I was really passionate about was writing about experiences that 
millennials and but before before they were called millennials um, were having it with engagement within the workforce. So I started interviewing my friends. I wrote some internal white papers that eventually um, I was really impressed by how Microsoft leadership, so their chief people officer, Lisa Brummel, read my paper and I was impressed by how much they, they cared about about what we had to say um, and I, then I began to see opportunities to really impact the culture um, via via my writing but through technology as well so I then switched jobs at Microsoft to a HR technology job um, but yeah it started by just uh, you know being passionate about people and and how they're treated and engaged within organizations. So Prima, how has your time how did your time at Microsoft help you with startups? A lot. So it's funny. Um, my first startup job after Microsoft, I had the hiring manager tell me that, you know, one, one of the things he was testing for in the interview is, am, am I going to be able to quickly, um, you know, adapt to this more fast paced environment? And, um, and, and I'd argue that Microsoft is just as fast paced as startups, but it's a different kind of fast paced, you know, it's your, um, you have larger uh, resource, you have more resources, you're working on more of a piece of a problem versus um, the whole problems. But I think the way it's helped is understanding things at scale. So, you know, I understand the impact of, you know, collecting certain pieces of data and, and what the laws are and what will happen if, if you become really big and all of a sudden you have a million data points. So I think just knowing what happens at scale is important um, because at a startup, oftentimes you're trying to get to that scale, you're not there yet. Um, and then I, I think there is, um, you know, I think there's a time and place for process. Uh, and I think having that kind of built in from having the big company experience helps me to learn, hey, you know, this is when we need process. This is where we don't need process from a startup standpoint. So those, those are kind of the things And I think a lot of these big tech companies like Microsoft and Amazon will train up their PMs to be a little more technical um, with, in, in some roles, which was good for me because um, I didn't have a hugely technical background, but I, I started to learn about systems and architecting them through my time at Microsoft. And Prem, so your background is product management, correct? Correct, yeah. When, when so there's a brand new startup, it's two co-founders, wouldn't they bring on a product manager, like employee number six, seven, wait to later on the road, they should do it themselves? Yeah, so I think it really, well, first I'd say you should start by doing everything yourself. So I think, um, you know, I, I'm kind of the product manager, de facto product manager at our organization. Kind of depends on what you're building. So, um, you know, I think uh, a lot of the functions of product management um, around planning, doing customer interviews, that, that sort of piece, I definitely believe the founders should do that, um, at least in the beginning until, until they can't anymore. Um, I, I think with some execution items, um, you can maybe begin to inter introduce people around what you were saying maybe, as you kind of dive a little deeper into the amount of employees you have, so 10 employees or something like that. Um, but but I, I definitely believe you should, founders should be doing everything until they can't anymore. And, and when I say everything, um, we, we have a ton of help. Um, so part-time designer, uh, but I guess in terms of hiring, a, if it's a product-led organization, which a lot of these SaaS businesses are, I think it's important that the founding team acts as product managers early on. Um, and then eventually maybe when, when it gets too big, um, they start adding folks. Preem, so you've been involved with startups for a while with seven different companies. Why do you keep on coming back to the startup world? Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I think um, I, it, it just, when I left my job at Microsoft and entered a startup, a tiny pulse, I just felt more at home. It was just more natural in terms of the work style, in terms of, you know, just the excitement and the, and the instability even. So I think I'm kind of drawn towards scenarios like that where there could be a huge potential upside um, but until you get there it's just a bunch of chaos and um, I you know Reed, ha -ha -ha, Reed Hoffman from LinkedIn um, has a quote saying I won't quote him exactly but a startup is you know like jumping off a moving airplane and then constructing a parachute on the way down which I uh, I, I really uh, you know I, I like that challenge and I, I like that, that um, ability to wear many hats and so not just one. And, oh, by the way, you jump into a cloud of fog, so you can't even see where you're going to fall in that. <laughs> yep. So you already talked about your company some. Can you talk about your company in more detail, like wh wh how did it came about, what your vision for it, what were you trying to solve? Yeah, so, um, so it came about um, really when I was at our last company, we were in the employee engagement space um, at, at Tiny Pulse and um, worked with a lot of customers that were 
in mid-market SMBs. Um, and what we found um, in Tiny Pulse is an awesome business, but we also found there was other pain that people had kind of up funnel in hiring, specifically in the mid-market, specifically for these high volume roles that are getting hundreds of resumes in, in screening and scheduling of candidates. Um, you know, as I talked to recruiters, there was just so much time being spent. Um, and even with that time investment, candidate experiences were still really low um, as I as I interviewed um, folks um, and you know we I started to see what was happening with Glassdoor and so that's kind of where the idea came about um, my co one of my co-founders was at Tiny Pulse as well um, he was in sales and I was on product so he'd often come to me um, saying hey you know that would be awesome if we were doing something in the recruiting space as well it, just, it wasn't core business of Tiny Pulse so we eventually started uh, the company um, we incorporated last February but I um, started full time in July. So um, our, our CEO at Tiny Pulse let me kind of have a flexible work arrangement for a while until I left. Um, and um, yeah, we've, uh, you know, got out to our first 17 customers and they're just um, growing and, and really enjoying the journey um, and, and really just focusing on, you know, starting on solving a specific problem and that that's screening for these high volume roles. So Cream, <laughs> of course, everyone's remote now. Were you a remote company before this all happened? We were, yeah. So in that regard, it's been um, a um, obviously not an easy transition, but some things we just already had in place. So we, you know, we're on Slack all the time. Uh, we do our, our team meetings at a regular cadence, virtually, um, not in person. So we, and it, one of my, uh, so we have five people um, full time, and the rest are part time. But we're spread between Seattle. Um, Bay Area, um, Vietnam. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, we were remote beforehand. So, you know, everyone like, is like remote so great. It's the best thing ever. But can you talk about some of the pros and cons of being remote and also some of the challenges? Yeah, I mean, my biggest challenge is, is definitely, and I'll talk about the pros as well. But my biggest challenge has de definitely been uh, balancing family and especially having two, two young kids. Um, we, we don't have the biggest house, so I, I, it's hard to kind of find that it's quiet space sometimes um and and also you know when when you're around around family and kids you kind of want to spend time with them it's natural so i think being able to really focus and, and one way i found uh, of doing that is you know taking a little time for myself like going on a walk while i'm doing a phone call or stepping into the backyard um, um so i think there's ways even in, in self-isolation where you can get get that time so i think that that's been one of my challenges um from a, from a work standpoint i think um communication has been pretty good as long as you have the, the right tools in place um but I, I do think from from a pro standpoint, um, my my commute was horrible uh, before, so I was um, spending a lot of time driving, um, a lot of money on gas. Um, um, I've, I found that there's you can create a pretty efficient day um, when you're working from home um, because you're not doing all this moving around. So that, that that's been one one pro for me. Um, and also, you know, I've been able to be just as close to a teammate that is in California as a teammate that's here. So there's less bias as you're interacting with folks and, and that sort of thing. So Preem, what's your process for hiring a remote worker? Because I'm a firm believer that everyone's not a good, good remote worker. Mm -hmm. What's your process figuring, okay, I really want to hire this person, but I don't know if they can handle remote work. How do you do that? Yeah, one of the things we're doing, and not to get too much into humanly again, but we're kind of coming up with these question packs. So here's a set of screening questions you should be asking if you're hiring for remote workers. Here's a set of questions you should be um, using if you're hiring for people on different time zones. So I, I think we've been recently been spending time in thinking through it. Um, I think it kind of just, part of it is including it in how you think about culture screening or, or, or is their work style conducive to remote work. Uh, one, I mean, one simple way of finding that out is looking at their past job history and, you know, have, have, have they done it before? A lot of people think we're, we're remote working um, remotely is, is right for them, but if until they've done it, um, they don't realize that it can bring some um, issues. Well, I think it takes a different type of communication style. Um, you know, you have to maybe um, go out of your way to to how to be good at written communication, um, to be, you know, engaged on the phone. Um, um, another thing is just, you know, do you have a setup at, at home that's conducive to to working from home from an internet um, standpoint, from a 
you know, maybe you don't have to have a home office, but some, some way of doing it. Um, you know, so I, I think I, I definitely ask a lot of questions and screening around their, their work style, their communication style, and not just how they act, but how they want to be interacted with. So one, one thing I find often with people jumping in a remote for the first time is they can do it, but all of a sudden they're not getting feedback delivered to them in the way that they're used to or craving. They're not getting as much face time with their manager. So they feel like that maybe they're not um, as close to leadership as someone who is in person. So I think, I think um, not just understanding, can they do the job, but are they going to get what they need out of working remote? So I'm guessing if someone said, I want to do, I want to do remote work because I'm tired of having my boss, my boss next to me every day, if I'm not the right answer, answer right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, d definitely not. Um, but yeah, it is, it's an important question. In a set, like overall, um, I was talking to a company, um, I won't mention their name, but big Seattle company. And they said the number one reason why people don't accept jobs at the company is, is because they don't have a strong uh, remote work policy. So it's not pay, it's not anything else. The number one reason why candidates reject their job offers is because of that. So yeah, it's definitely something important to think about, especially now. So what do you think is happening? You know, you know all this stuff goes away, hopefully pretty soon. And these companies can say, okay, your vacation is over with, you know, you did your remote work, now come back to work in the company, right? What do you think is going to happen? I'm thinking a lot of workers are going to be like, okay, you want me to spend an hour or two hours a day on the road again? You want me to be at the workplace eight, hour, eight hours again? So that's fun part. Other part is like, okay, come to myself. Okay, I don't need you. There's all these unemployed people here now. I'll just go to them, right? So I think it's going to be interesting how that plays out. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's a really interesting kind of experiment that we've been kind of forced into. Um, and, you know, I don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but I, I, I think employers generally are, even some managers that weren't or leaders that weren't as comfortable with remote work are now, in some cases, seeing that, hey, this could work out. Um, employees are just as efficient or more efficient. In some cases, if they're not um, wired to work from home, maybe they're less efficient. But I think this is at least shown and forced leadership to take a look at this. And they might find that, hey, it's, it's, a, it's much better than paying for employees to commute in, give them parking space, um, um, pay for all the expenses with, with housing um, workers that are on site. Um, it might make some sense for us to actually now uh, allow people to continue to work from home in some cases. So I think that could happen. You're right. I mean, there are going to be a lot of um, candidates out there um, th th with the unemployment rates um, the way they are. I think the, the good companies are not going to, you know, let go of existing employees, but it could be interesting to fill those pipelines. And, and it, it starts now. I mean, that's one thing we're talking about a lot at Humanly. Like, how can you nurture that pipeline now? So when you're out of a hiring freeze, all of a sudden you have a, a set of candidates on deck. So Prima, if you're not before, talking about before, there's like hundreds of recruiting companies out there. How are you getting your, your company in front of these other recruiting companies and getting the advantage when you go out to talk to potential customers? Yeah. So there's a couple of things. I mean, one, one thing is just the market segment focused. I mean, we're focusing very specifically on mid-market industries that have roles that are high volume, high turnover, and repetitive screening questions. So um, some of the competitors are not playing in that space. But I, I think the number one thing we're looking at differently than than I see most any other um, recruiting tech right now, and, and this is how good recruiters look at it, where success of the platform is not that someone was hired, um, which, which is how people are thinking about it now, but it should be that they had a high impact throughout their career, um, that they had a high employee lifetime value. So I think starting to plug into post-hire data sources like an HCM system and saying that, hey, these cohorts of people ended up being great culture fits. These cohorts of people were strong technically and think of it almost more holistically and cyclically than just let's make hire as efficiently as possible. So I think, you know, being armed, we're, we're, we consider ourselves a data company at the end of the day. So I think arming our customers with ways to look at hiring in, in that regard and not just hiring for a specific role, but hiring for competencies and then seeing, did these people really pan out or did they not? And then what can we improve in our process to get more folks that do pan out is one thing. Um, I also think a lot of the a lot of the kind of efficiency plays from an automation standpoint are beginning to be commoditized. Like it's easy to 
um, you know, plug into an API and post your job to a bunch of places or resume parsing is beginning to be more commoditized with these applicant tracking systems. So where I see the real value in what we're doing and what other companies are doing is around the data itself and what it can tell you about who you're bringing in, who's leaving and, and how, you, um, how you grow towards your roadmap. Cream, can you talk a little about what HR challenges you're seeing small business owners having right now? Yeah, and we, you know, I would, I would say one of the biggest ones is, is around culture. So, um, you know, are, are we keeping our in current employees engaged and, um, and happy and high performing? Are we bringing in new employees uh, that, um, you know, that, that, the help not just fit to what we have, but help us grow towards our culture roadmap. Um, you know, there's a, a great quote, and again, I forget who said this, but, um, you know, I, I, I can't remember if I mentioned it at the beginning, but I really, really live by it. And that's like to win the marketplace, you need to first win the workplace. And I think that there's, a, you know, looking introspectively and then making sure your employees are engaged is very challenging right now when some some people have been forced to work remote when they weren't before and maybe some that don't like working remote are doing that um it, it has become harder i think um to really measure and 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 create that good culture and bring people in that fit it um but but i there's a lot of tools out there there's a lot of ways one can do that but that, that's been i think a challenge i've seen people deal with maintaining that that strong culture in tough times I think you bring up a good point. I think a lot of companies, they, they'll tell you, I want to take care of the customers, but so few say, I want to take care of my employees into my customers. Why, why do you think <laughs> that is? Yeah, it's a good question. And yeah, I mean, if you take care of your employees, um, then, you know, they, they will take care of your customers. And that's not just your current employees. Um, I think your current employees should be your number one customer, um, but future employees. So what are you doing when you're bringing people new in? Um, are, are they going to add to your culture and help it grow? Um, as far as why I think that is, I, I think, you know, traditionally um, people haven't had the data to make that direct connection. So they look at bottom line numbers, they look at what the board's telling them and they say, hey, we need to increase revenue. So let, let's make our customers, um, happy and, and it's, which is very important customers are extremely important but but i think um when you think of when you actually start using tools where you can measure how engaged your employees are you can then start to say hey we can we can say that um you know our employees are not engaged and you can even correlate that to, to changes in revenue higher churn less retention of customers so i think part of it it was it's just hard to measure in the past and now there's a lot of tools that will help you measure employee engagement and things of that nature Preem, understanding you have something for our listeners today. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're doing a lot um, of offers, um, some free, some at heavy discounts um, to help folks that are hiring um, through COVID-19. So that includes actively hiring. So our, our tool will help with screening, with scheduling. Um, it also includes building up your pipeline so that when you're done with the with your hiring freezes um, you have candidates on deck so we're offering a lot of sourcing um, and it's not just through our technology we have staff um, in, in the company so you'll have a real human working with you so yeah if any of that's of interest you can definitely uh, shoot me an email at prem humanly.io and Preem can you share your social media for both yourself and your company so people can reach out to you yeah, so um, Twitter is at HumanlyHR, um, and then mine is at Prem Kumar Tweets, um, my first name P-R-E-M, last name K-U-M-A-R, and, and Tweets. Um, and then you can look me up by my name on, on LinkedIn, as well as the company on LinkedIn as well. And for our listeners, we'll have the links to his gift and his social media on, on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetshrblog.com, and be sure to um, share this episode with your friends. Pim, we're coming to the end of our talk. Can you give us any wisdom or advice on any subject you want to talk about? Um, just keep going. I think, you know, when we talked about, about writing, how you become a good writer is, is you write. And I think um, to survive through these tough times, just, just keep doing what you're doing. Keep getting into, keep yourself motivated, keep your teams motivated, you know, and, and like you said, networking and things like that are connecting yourself with other folks is maybe one good way of, of keeping that going. But um, yeah, I know I really appreciate you making the time to have me here. Thank you, Prem, for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.